Tonight, we honor the stories of women and ministry, recognizing that it has not always been an easy road for our mothers and sisters in the faith. We celebrate their legacy as the hymn proclaims, striving undaunted through the years, till bolted doors have opened wide, faith of our mothers, firm and strong, voices long silenced rise in song. Tonight, we're privileged to hear from one of the trailblazing women who has been responsible for pushing open the doors for women's leadership in the church. Katie Geneva Cannon is the Annie Scales Rogers Professor of Christian Ethics at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. Previously, Dr. Cannon served on the faculty at Temple University, the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the New York Theological Seminary. Dr. Cannon is the first African-American woman ordained in the United Presbyterian Church. Forty some years ago, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She's also the first African American woman to earn the Doctor of Philosophy degree from Union Theological Seminary in New York. <laughs> Her scholarship focuses on the areas of Christian ethics, womanist theology, and women and religion in society. Dr. Cannon is the author or editor of six books, including Katie's Canon, <laughs> Womanism and the Soul of the Black Community, Black Womanist Ethics, and the recently published anthology, The Womanist Theological Reader. She is past president of the Society for the Study of Black Religion and is the recipient of numerous honors and prizes, including the 2011 American Academy of Religion Excellence in Teaching Award, the John Jasper Trailblazer Award from Sixth Mount Zion Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia, and the Union Medal, the highest award of distinction presented by Union Theological Seminary in New York City. We're deeply honored to have her with us tonight. Her lecture is entitled, Thinking with Our Hearts, Feeling with Our Brains, Testimonies of Faith That History Might Otherwise Forget. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Katie Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I get into the lecture, I have to give a preamble, which is some of you uh, have known me a long time and wondering why I'm walking with a cane, and others of you are meeting me for the first time and probably think I've been walking with a cane a long time. Uh, this time last year, I was on a walker. On July the 18th, 2016, I had a heart attack. Uh, I didn't have the kind of heart attack where your arteries are clogged. I have the kind they call a widow maker. You don't know you have the condition until you drop dead. And so uh, I was reading, getting ready, because we're getting ready to launch the Womanist Center down at Richmond in April. And we had a consultant coming in. So I was doing my homework, and I was tired. I got up to go from the recliner. I got in bed. And when I woke up, my ankle was like this, blue and purple. And so I was like, I walked to bed. How can I not walk now? Uh, and when I couldn't stand up on it, I said, oh, that means it's broken. So I sat in the floor for over an hour because, before I called my sister to come go with me to the emergency room. I dislocated one bone in my right ankle and broken another. What happened was I kicked myself back to life. I was totally unconscious. I have no idea how it happened. They kept saying, how did you break your ankle? I said, I don't know. I laid down and I woke up and it was broken. 
And so one of my good friends in Richmond, the Reverend Dr. Carol Mosley said, the angels surrounded me that day and said, not yet, not yet, not yet. So one of the reasons I might be here is for this occasion. Maybe I was spared to be here today. Not yet. Thinking with our hearts, feeling with our brains, testimonies of faith that history might otherwise forget. My guess is that some of you are slightly puzzled, questionably intrigued, somewhat baffled or caught in an intellectual quandary by the title of tonight's lecture. The vast majority among us may wonder if thinking with our hearts and feeling with our brains is a semantic paradox or mixed up, shook up verbal quibble that aimlessly muddles and befuddles the brain. A few sisters and brothers in the audience upon hearing the phrase, thinking with our hearts and feeling with our brains, may question whether it's even humanly possible to switch around the functions of our brain with the work of our hearts to change a convoluted mass of gray matter into a pumpkin-like red fleshy rhythmic muscle. Thus, as we cogitate and speculate, wondering if we're capable as human beings to alter, to adapt, and to allow our hearts to engage in our intellectual talk while our brain grapples with sensations necessary for us to take step by step in our religious walk. One or two of us may even chuckle to ourselves at what sounds like a laughable, inconsistent absurdity not only to wrap our minds about what it means to think with our hearts and feel with our brains, but to connect such survivalist intentions to the faith of our mothers, whereby we lift up our voices, making a joyful noise, shouting from the top of the mountains, testimonies of faith that history might otherwise forget. Between now and the end of the conference this Wednesday, I invite everyone here to take time and to identify how the faith of our mothers is manifested in a variety of ways, across generations, among distinct styles of worship, and within the particularities of our racial and ethnic communities. Furthermore, long after this conference ends and each of us return to our homes, I encourage you to mind the mother load of testimonies of faith that history might otherwise forget. By this I mean let us affirm the women in our lives the women who do debunk, the women who unmask, the women who disentangle religiously inscribed justified injustice morning by morning and day by day. Now the story I'd like to share with you this evening bears witness to the faith of my mothers. This story validates the testimonies of the confidence, the convictions and the allegiance of my maternal great-grandmother, my maternal grandmother and my mother. How these three generations of women taught me how to rock steady in the blessed assurance of God Almighty as our creator and our sustainer. Yes, the living faith of my foremother continues to build every day and every time I feel torn down. Their living testimonies serve as re endless reinforcement whenever I need to be propped up on every leaning side. Therefore, among my encyclopedia of life lessons, this specific cautionary tale goes like this. While I was in the process of finishing graduate coursework in a doctoral program at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, I enrolled in a seminar with a world-renowned white male biblical scholar. This man ranted, raged, and delivered a scolding diatribe in his critique of my final paper. He screamed, how dare you write a paper that causes me to feel? <laughs> there should be no sensation, no tiliation, no stimulation when I read your work. I sat in his office, utterly, utterly dumbfounded by his berated assessment of my work. I had proven competence at the most demanding level in all my other courses. Therefore, I knew my paper was academically solid. From beginning to end, I demonstrated competency in mastering the stated norms in biblical criticism. I exceeded the benchmark criteria for textual criticism, source criticism, grammatic criticism, redactive criticism, <laughs> so forth and so on. I knew I had written a first-rate exegetical paper, a revelatory narrative that was full of intense, deep down, heartwarming, soulful vibrations. My research was a genuine enfleshment of womanist 
themes. What I mean by this is that as, Af as an African-American female scholar, I am consciously present as an embodied person each and every time I engage in the complicated work of translating, reading, and analyzing texts. So I struggle to understand the relationship between embodied, mediated knowledge and failure, knowing that womanist work is cognitive, it is intuitive, and womanism is a legitimate academic enterprise that changes the index in theological education. Why did this professor evaluate my work with such disdain and dismissal? What makes humanizing knowledge so terribly wretched and awfully despicable? What is so wrong in uniting our heads with our hearts? Why is it unsound for us to blend usable wisdom from our heart with rigorous practical intellect? A renowned historian, Dr. Charles Long, argues that enslaved women and men and children who were branded like cattle with company mobs, who were shackled in dungeons of slave castles, and who were crammed into the bottom of poorly ventilated ships with their face pressed to the backs of those chained in front of them in the transatlantic journey. We had to learn how to think with our bodies in the midst of devastating terror, horror, and brutality. The story records tell us that the treatment on the slave ships was so harsh and the conditions were so horrendous that one out of every eight Africans died during the journey. There are estimates and guesstimates that somewhere between 6 million to 60 million Africans are buried in the watery graves of the Atlantic. The biblical scholar concluded his high decimal tongue lashing with the comment, I should be able to read your paper and not feel anything. More specifically, writing my paper in the language of embodied academies, that is, by writing in an analytical style concretizing race, gender, and social class, the professor may have experienced my words as sharp blades, flaying open, repressed, compressed, depressed feelings of his unacknowledged fire and fervor. In turn, this notable scholar, con scholar concluded his tirade of condemnation by saying, my exposition was an abomination because my paper provoked, encouraged, aroused too much combustible feelings. My paper was so bad, he said he couldn't even flunk it. <laughs> now you know that's very bad. In accordance with this Reverend Doctor's professional persona, he said he did not want to waste any more of his time, not even to write the letter F on my paper. Fortunately for me, during times like these, I call on the lessons of faith I inherited from my foremothers. Now this first set of faith lessons moving through space and time that enabled me to deal with this situation, equipping, equipping me with both will and skill to push against isolation, alienation, and extermination is the faith or the faith testimonies I inherited from my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother, Mary Nance Lytle, was born in 1832 and died on July 8, 1930 in Mecklenburg County in North Carolina. My great-grandmother's parents and grandparents were among the millions of Africans enslaved in the Americas. People of African ancestry enslaved in North America were reduced to the status of livestock and pieces of chattel property. By all account, my enslaved kinfolk were classified as non-persons. They were assigned to the last place in the great chain of human beings, supposedly locked permanently in subhuman status. Even the United States Constitution counted a black person as three-fifths of a white man. My great-grandmother Mary Nance lied on all the family members who preceded her. They knew their worldview and their understanding of God had to be different from the Europeans from maritime Christian countries who were running slave ships. My great-grandmother knew that the enslaved and the enslaver cannot serve the same God. Generations after generations, my family continued to believe God is great, God is good. Even when enslaved Africans were told we were not members of the human race. Even when preachers preached that we were not fashioned in the image of God. And even when evangelists taught catechism lessons that placed people of African ancestry on the outside of salvation history. There are testimonies throughout the slave narratives bearing witness to enslave people's clear-eyed vision and knowing the difference between right and wrong, the difference between good and evil. By holding on to God's unchanging hand, my ancestors knew God does not make inferior people. 
Instead, black people looked at wickedness through the lens of the epistemologic privilege of the press. And they created spiritual songs and lamentation. They created melodious sounds of resistance and joyful hymns of praise. Of the 15 plus children my great grandmother brought into this world, all of them except my grandfather were classified as slaves. My grandfather, Emmanuel Clayton Lytle, born August 21st, 1865, was the first and only freeborn child in his ancestral line. My grandfather's parents, all of his siblings, and all my grandfather's ancestors that we know in my family by name lived as enslaved people here in the United States of America. The only reason my grandfather was born free is due to the fact the Civil War ended on April 9th, 1865, when Robert E. Lee surrendered the last Confederate army to U Ulysses S. Grant. And four months later, on the 21st of August, 1865, my grandfather was born. In the aftermath of the Civil War, my great-grandmother Mary, a God-fearing woman, walked from plantation to plantation till she found her children. She searched high and low for her daughters and her sons, taken from her and sold as chattel property. As Toni Morrison says when talking about the enslaved people, Morrison says slaveholders were stealing and selling African-American children at such a young age that oftentimes mothers had not formed a lot of memories. Imagine the trauma of giving birth to children not being able to recognize their children's hands. They have no idea what their permanent teeth look like. No knowledge of how their jawbones changed over the years. Fundamentally, Tony Morrison tells us that enslaved Africans transcended their victimization by embracing amazing grace. God's amazing grace supported blacks against the nastiness of life. With only her faith in God and intuitive instinct to guide her, my great-grandmother Mary Nance Slider walked and walked until she found her children and put her family back together. My great-grandmother Mary walked from plantation to plantation, and when she found her long-lost children, she said, that one's mine, and that one's mine, and that one's mine, and she brought them all home. And like Tony Morrison says so well, if we'd had more water, we would have made more tears. If we'd had more water, we would have made more tears. Yes, it is a faith I inherited from my great-grandmother Mary that energizes me to run on and see what the end is going to be. So with fortitude like my great-grandmother who walked miles and miles and put her family back together, I use that same kind of living faith of instinctive, investigative determinism to try and figure out why my, my research paper was an abomination. What made my paper so flawed that the professor said he couldn't even flunk it? So I began by thinking, maybe in some form or fashion, my conflation of mind and body, my fusion of head and heart throughout my research paper, triggered a shift in the professor's register of epistemological hierarchy. Or maybe I appeared to be a potential threat to this man's personhood, whereby my research exposed hypocrisies embedded in the systemic and structured race, sex, class oppression inherent in his normalized tools of evaluation. Or maybe the professor denounced my hermeneutical findings because my research exposed his complicity and various forms of restrictions and strategies of exclusion subjugating me as the other. And in turn, my exegesis of this specific pericope appeared to be an attempt to steal some of his academic currency when I expanded the boundaries throughout my research to the inclusive we. Or maybe, just maybe, what troubles the professor is, not, is that my style of writing is non-monolithical. Thus, thus the professor's verbal put down gave me the impression my research represented some kind of dislodging of his aristocratic intellectual monopoly by exposing his unjustly discriminating practices. Now the strange thing about this display of aggravated annoyance and one-dimensional litmus test for scholarly authenticity is that the critique of my work was an oxymoron, and it was very ironic. The irony is that the title of my paper was The Agony in Gethsemane. <laughs> and, the, and the name of the graduate seminar was The Passion Narratives. <laughs> this semester-long seminar on the Passion Narratives focused on how Jesus was tragically rejected, unfairly condemned, viciously beaten, 
horribly insulted and cruelly mistreated by multiple groups of people. The sequence of assignments in this seminar focused on the Last Supper, the rest at Gethsemane, the accusation and charges during the trial. We gave sustained attention in the course to crucifixion, death, burial, and discovery of the empty tomb. In my research, I even discussed how down through the centuries, a large number of artists referred to the passion narratives as a source of their inspiration. It is common practice for the passion narratives to serve as the scripture, women and men, when pondering, probing, and percolating at the most fundamental levels and in the most essential ways when creating visual images and sacred icons and when composing both liturgical and ritualistic music. Thus, for me, researching and writing a paper about the agony in Gethsemane in an abstract, abstruse, disembodied mode felt like an oxymoron, one of those push-pull oppositional binaries that places our mind in combative competition over and against our bodies, wherein our spiritual self battles against our scientific self and our emotions sandpaper against reason. In other words, the agony of Gethsemane stood out for me as a worthwhile research topic because it was one of the touchstones discussed throughout the seminar. However, standing to lose the most from transgressing the exacting standards of androcentric norms and considered a failure for interrupting the male-centered status quo in this in industry of theological education. Because I defined, elaborated, exemplified, and justified in concrete and gettable language the agony in Gethsemane, I knew that it was not the professor, but I was the person who had to acquiesce. I was the one who was falling in step with the instructions of my teacher, whose implicit racialized assumptions and gendered prejudice were in congruence with his primary assessment of me as a so-called inferior woman of color. Reinforcing value-laden educational practices with the perpetual challenge to enflesh self-authenticity, the professor required me to rewrite my exegesis paper in accordance with detached, disengaged, dispassionate, methodological metrics, a specific kind of hoop jumping that functions unquestionably as the gold standard of successful scholarship. The professor made it absolutely clear the racial ethnic sources I cited in my original paper were women and men he could not and women and men he would not acknowledge as significant, as respectable, nor as authoritative sources. So I spent hours carefully rewriting tedious, cut and dried, formulaic drafts of my research paper, deliberately dismembering the presence of all voices from the African diaspora so that I could master the technique of writing as a disembodied talking head. <laughs> <clears throat> Given the sensitive nature of the location of power dynamics between faculty and students, while hissing through grit, grit te gritted teeth, I remove our references, citations, and quotations that were not Eurocentric. The calculus of this type of colonizing of the mind required me to write and rewrite, repeatedly bleaching and neutering myself over and over again in order to earn what traditional armchair academicians identify as above average scholarship. Drawing on all my strength, I wrote draft after draft, I composed shallow, rigid, asymmetrical, arcane, unemotional prose from the neck up. I drafted the kind of glorified narratives that are, 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 that are opaque and unintelligible to anyone but those of us trained in the top tier seminaries. It is important for us to focus on, this, on, this, on these specific experiences of negotiating with persons situated at the top of institutions of power. Because what I'm sharing with you is not isolated experiences of assembly line meanness, but the pervasive damaged messages embedded in this type of complex grid of antagonistic qualifications are replicated time and time again with routine occurrences. For so many women in the church, in the academy, and throughout large segments of contemporary society. The truth is by coming to terms with these types of painful, contestable struggles, and by confronting prevailing norms of disrespected exchanges of mainstream indoctrination, all of us need to be aware how the rubrics of mass market analytics and straight-jacketed heteropatriarchal conformity is far too often taken for granted as normal 
as natural and neutral, when in reality, heteropatriarchal conformity is not normal, is not natural, nor is it neutral. Dear beloved sisters and brothers, this brings me to my second set of faith testimonies. The stories of faith I inherited from my grandmother, Rosa Cornelius White Lytle, born February 22, 1882, and died in February 1975, also in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina. My grandmother's overarching social cultural reality was a world where black people were surrounded by dominating whiteness. Jim Crow, the chief cornerstone of apartheid in the United States of America, was a political manifestation of state and local laws requiring a fixed, rigid system of racial segregation. The stringent application of Jim Crow laws made it punishable offense for black people and white people to travel, to eat, to wait, to be buried, to make love, to play, relax, and even speak together, except in stereotype context of superior and inferior interactions. Between 1890 until 1965, legal authorities and public acceptability forced racial separation as a mechanism to dilute systematically the civil liberties of African Americans. White supremacy was the order of the day. For example, as an African American child growing up in the 1950s in Kannapolis, North Carolina, each school day, I, along with my classmates, we stood tall, crossed our hearts, and pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And yet at the same time, we lived in a world where the rigid social conduct between blacks and whites demanded and also commanded black people to go to black doors, back doors and drink out of colored water fountains. It was against the law for black children to play in tax-supported public parks. It was against the law for us to skate in tax-supported public rinks. It was against the law for us to swim in tax-supported public pools. In this racist landscape, to swing on swings, to slide down slides, to build castles and sandboxes where white children played resulted in swift punishment. As survivors of this type of separate but unequal legal system, students at the George Washington Carver School, we sang all the verses, my country tears of the sweet land of liberty, and yet we had to remain self-consciously aware that it was against the law for us to go to the public library. It was even a transgression for me and other Negro children to sign up to participate in the Kannapolis Citywide Spelling Contest. As a result of white supremacy, as black children, we used books from the white schools three years after the white students threw them away. We used their musical instruments, their school desks, their chemistry sets, their periodical charts, and their microscopes at least five years after they were salvaged from the trash bins. So complete was the circle of the apartheid laws of segregation. If an African-American person walked through the front door of the YW or the YMCA for afternoon activities, it was a matter of life and death. Like detectives, anti-black racism required African-Americans, both youth and adults, to discern the gigantic as well as the minute extensions of the social framework of white supremacy. Black people never wanted to risk acting in any way that might be detrimental to our health and safety. Yes, this was a type of existential reality surrounding my grandmother's generation. Nevertheless, my ancestors created a faith that was life-affirming, often referred to as that old-time religion. African-American women, men, and children who were post-Civil War and pre-Civil Rights had to come to their own independent judgment about doctrines such as theology, Christology, pneumatology, ecclesiology, missiology, and especially the doctrine of theodicy. The sole wrestling question for my grandma Rosie and her generation was this. How do we justify the goodness of God in the face of so much evil? Or as my grandmother used to say, can God create a rock that God can't pick up? Can God create a rock that God can't pick up? Yes, this was a steady, full, faithful testimony of my grandmother, the living witness that she passed on to me and my generation, that even when the road is rough and the going gets tough, the God we serve has sufficient knowledge, the God we serve has sufficient power, God, we serve has sufficient presence to make a way out of no way. Therefore, let us run on and see what the end is going to be. That's the third and final set of lessons of faith I learned were taught to me by my mother, Corrine Lyder Cannon. 
My mother was born in December 1919. And the only reason she's not here today is she's planning her 98th birthday party. <clears throat> she already has 300 people. We're trying to get it down. To me. She entered this world, my mother entered this world in a year when white mob violence, bloody race riots, and hate strikes broke out in northern and southern cities across this country. That was 1919. It is important for us to note that at least 5,000 African Americans have been lynched in the U.S. of A. During a 50-year stretch of my mother's lifetime, a black person was lynched approximately every two and a half days. As a matter of fact, as Tuskegee Institute reported, that 1952, 1952 was the first year in 71 years of tabulation that no black person was lynched in America. Against this historical backdrop, my mother often shares her testimonies of faith in the forms of parables. She says parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. So when I told my mother what I was going through with this particular professor, she said, you know they're hiring at the mill. I said, no, I think I can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother said, um, talking in parables, she said, there are many slips between the cup and the lip. Whatever you do, you always have to think of the latter end. Some of you know every shut eye ain't sleep and every goodbye ain't gone. And most importantly, in relation to this specific situation, my mother said, when you have your head in the lion's mouth, you have to treat the lion very gently. So after much bleaching and a whole lot of mutilated sterilizing of my research paper, I resubmitted it, and however, it's important to note, I never received a letter grade. But instead, the professor used a rubber stamp and okayed my paper by stamping the word pass. In essence, what I'm saying here this evening is that we must pay attention. Each and every time we run into power brokers like this person who is trashing my paper, we must pay, pay, we must pay special attention whenever we encounter people who stand in the long shadow of androcentric white supremacy and participate in this kind of life-denying mechanisms. Folk who peddle this type of dogmatism, who insist that you and I must not only imitate, but we also must emulate poisonous forms of manufactured cultural hegemony. Their playbook is value-laden, is rigid in predictability. Their playbook is firmly fixed facts, is repeatable phenomena. And most of all, it's an illusion of value-free space. Like so many vanguards with dominating authority, they believed the lie that so-called academic rigor and the economy of scholarly excellence equals value-free, color-blank, apolitical, mathematically calculated, universal objectivity. The taxonomy, somebody else had the experience. <laughs> The taxonomy of this type of odorless, tasteless, and heartless instruction is the ideological arm of the empire. Favoritism is shown to willers and dealers who dominate the collective consciousness and possess power to institutionalize male stream imperatives. Indeed, professors and colleagues who benefit from unquestionable hegemonic knowledge and academicians who sanction misogynistic thinking patterns reinforce male superiority. These are the same people who tend to exploit, to disregard, even to deny the existence of socially constructed criteria and the multiple interlocking systems of inequalities that exist within the broader context of our country. Moreover, these are the exact same power brokers who hold in place racial, sexual, and class elitist hierarchies. Yes, they're the ones who seldom acknowledge their opposition to new methods of meaning making and new sites of intellectual inquiry. Instead, in their worldview, there's no space, no place for polycentric possibilities. There's no room for right relating. Instead, this type of aggression of wrongheadedness ends up trivializing transformative consciousness. This type of wrongheadedness ends up dismissing evolving educational possibilities. This type of wrongheadedness underutilized embodied mediated knowledge. Furthermore, these behind the scene operators 
who worship both whiteness and maleness. They are the ones who dictate the stories that will be included in the master narratives. And they are the ones who will determine what data will be omitted from dominant religious discourse. And due to the foreclosure of inclusive research possibilities, theological constructions of gendered racism, and concrete policies of sexual inequalities situate the majority of women in a constant state of embattlement. For too often as women, we are attacked with brutal hostility and vindictive violence, not only for what we do, but for who we are. A large number of traditions circulating throughout our educational institutions are entangled with ontological ramifications. Pressure is applied to those of us caught in these kinds of cruel intellectual religious vice grips, whereby if we want to pass our courses and graduate, or if we want to move through various judicatories and get ordained, then we must not protest. If we want to move ahead in actualizing our vocational endeavors, we must accommodate racist sexism and sexist racism. The pressure applied both formally and informally, the pressure applied overtly and covertly requires women, both young newcomers and old timers, to acquiesce to male-centered law and order. And we must acquiesce without complaint. And we must conform to outdated standards that alienate our personhood from our God-given right of human beingness. To make this point another way is to say there are powers and principalities that have a stranglehold on how people should think, how people should write, and how we should read. These dominant power brokers assume their type of norm precludes any other understanding of truth. And yet for those among us who are progressive thinkers, for all of us who are serious about participating in real world liberation, for freedom, justice, and the fullness of life, we know in our heart of hearts that the origins are authentic and creative ideas they are not possible if we're muzzled. They are not possible if we're handcuffed. They are not possible if we're chained and shackled, nor if we're clamped down and locked up. Yes, far too often, stakeholders who capitalize upon this kind of patriarchal status impose constructions that are suspect. They put in existence standards of truth without proof. Dear the beloved, it is the religious beliefs inherited from my foremothers that equip me with the know-how to keep on keeping on. Yet it's due to the living faith of my great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother living still that enables me to teach others for the past 45 years how to learn by way of embodied, mediated knowledge. For 45 years, I've been teaching every student how to think with our hearts and feel with our brains so no one will ever have to experience what I experience. Therefore, the bottom line fundamental testimonies of faith I offer to you this evening are the life lessons from my foremothers who survived 300 plus years of chattel slavery. Women who lived three, through 300 plus years of legalized segregation, moving from segregation to desegregation to resegregation. Women who persevered decade after decade, standing against lynching and mass incarceration. And my four mothers have this to say to you about a testimony of faith that history might otherwise forget. And this is it. Each of, us, each of us must remember the cautionary message. Even when they lie, they lie. Even when they lie, they lie. That's a whole lot, ain't it? Messes with the brain. So I want to close the night with a prayer that my grandmother had us to say every night. She created it. She said, when wasting age and shock and strife, shall have sapped these walls of life, then take this dust that's earthly worn and mold it into heavenly form. When waste and age and shock and strife, shall have sapped these walls of life, then, then take this dust that's earthly worn and mold it into heavenly form. Thank you.